Welcome to part two of this series of screencasts introducing zones of maritime jurisdiction. So last time we talked broadly about maritime zones and in particular those zones under territorial sovereignty, internal waters in the territorial sea. And we used this diagram to sketch out where we were going. So we're now moving out beyond the 12 nautical mile territorial sea to look at zones of state jurisdiction, the contiguous zone and the exclusive economic zone, where states enjoy more limited rights. So let's begin our examination of these zones, zones where states have sovereign rights or rights of jurisdiction. And we'll start with the contiguous zone. So the most obvious thing to note is that the contiguous zone is a maritime zone adjacent to the territorial sea and it can extend to a maximum limit of 24 nautical miles from baselines. And it's a zone of limited powers and functions. It's a zone where the coastal state may prevent and punish infringements of its customs, fiscal, immigration and sanitary laws, and regulations occurring within its territory or territorial sea. And we'll come back to what that means in a certain amount of detail. But this useful map prepared by Geoscience Australia, or rather a useful diagram, gives us some indication of how the zones can interact. So islands can generate territorial sea and contiguous zone and an exclusive economic zone as well as the mainland. So over here we have baselines of the type we talked about last time, a bay forming internal waters. Then we have a territorial sea, contiguous zone and the exclusive economic zone. Coastal waters is an Australian legal concept we don't need to worry about. but because islands can project zones in, as it were, all directions, you can have pockets of territorial sea off the coast of a state, and that's worth noting. Well, let's press on. What can you do in your contiguous zone? What's it there for? Well, it's there for essentially a number of functions, but largely customs, migration, and related issues. So obviously the powers available in a contiguous zone will cover matters such as the smuggling of drugs or migrants. There's also the reference to estate sanitary laws. And in this context, it refers to things such as Australia's strict quarantine law on the importation of plants and animals. The exact text of Article 33.1 of UNCLOS talks about a distinction between prevention and punishment. So it relates to these infringements of customs, fiscal, immigration or sanitary laws and regulation within the territory or territorial sea, but it can prevent or punish those. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means it can prevent these offences from occurring or punish them when they already have occurred. And note that under paragraph B, they must occur within territory or the territorial sea. You don't get to extend these laws necessarily to the contiguous zone itself, at least not on a strict textual interpretation. So this raises the point of how do we interpret Article 33? Do we take a strict textual interpretation or is a more liberal interpretation possible where you can say, well, actually, we can treat our laws, at least the laws of the type mentioned in Article 33, as applying within the contiguous zone. So you could commit an offence within the contiguous zone. It doesn't have to have occurred within our land territory or our territorial sea. How would this work? So those who take a strict interpretation emphasize that Article 33 does not give a state legislative power to extend its customs and other laws into the contiguous zone. That is, on this approach, the contiguous zone is an enforcement zone. It allows a state to take action against ships which have already committed an offense in its territorial sea or territory or to prevent them from so doing. So Article 33b thus applies either to outbound ships, so they've already committed an offence in territory or the territorial sea, or hovering vessels, hovering being a technical term here, which have used small boats to travel to the shore to complete an offence. So for example, a mothership might offload a cargo of drugs uh, in a speedboat, which then communicates with the shore. So the contiguous zone would cover that situation. Now, paragraph A on prevention, which I've mentioned, would allow measures such as inspection and warning 
regarding inbound ships, but it could not, however, justify arrest because no offence would yet have been committed. Okay, so on this strict interpretation, the contiguous zone is a zone where you can perhaps conduct measures of inspection against ships that appear inbound that you think may complete an offence if they enter the territorial sea, or it allows an extended zone of enforcement where vessels have already committed an offence within territory or the territorial sea, including perhaps by their small boats. Now, a more liberal interpretation would allow states to extend their relevant legislation into the contiguous zone and give it full application there. So breaches of customs, fiscal, immigration or sanitary laws could be committed on this approach in the contiguous zone and result in enforcement measures such as boarding, inspection and indeed uh, arrest of a vessel and its crew. Now some states do take this more liberal view in their national legislation, including India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. There's one other interesting feature of the contiguous zone that we should note, other than these customs, uh, fiscal migration and sanitary laws, which is that they provide jurisdiction over archaeological objects under Article 303.2 of UNCLOS. So we're talking here about um, shipwrecks and other items we might find on the seafloor. Article 303.2 provides that in order to control traffic in archaeological and historical objects, the coastal state may presume that their removal from the seabed in the contiguous zone without the coastal state's approval would result in an infringement within its territory or territorial sea of its laws and regulations applicable under Article 33. Now, as Tanaka explains, this provision creates two legal fictions. First, that removal of such archaeological artefacts is to be treated as an infringement of laws that may be applied in the contiguous zone. Second, that removal is then treated as if it occurred within the territorial sea. So this is an interesting provision, but ultimately provides jurisdiction to the coastal state over archaeological artefacts out to 24 nautical miles. All right, that's the contiguous zone. Let's turn to then to the exclusive economic zone. So the first thing to note about the exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, is that it can extend up to 200 nautical miles from a coastal state's baselines. But to understand a state's rights and powers in the EEZ, we need four concepts. The idea of sovereign rights, jurisdiction, the preserved freedoms of third states, and residual rights. So the idea here is that the exclusive economic zone involves a balance between the interests of coastal states in certain matters, principally dealing with resources in waters adjacent to their coastline, but also the rights of other states, which I'll typically refer to as third states, such as their freedom to navigate through these waters unhindered. So we'll be exploring these four concepts, sovereign rights, jurisdiction, the preserved rights of third states, and the issue of residual rights. What do you do when the rights don't appear to have been allocated either to the coastal state or a navigating state under the terms of the convention? Let's start with the issue of sovereign rights. And by sovereign here, we largely mean exclusive, but I'll come back to that. So the principal article of the convention dealing with rights in the exclusive economic zone is Article 56, which provides that the coastal state has sovereign rights for the purpose of exploring and exploiting, conserving and managing natural resources, whether living or non-living, of the waters superjacent to the seabed and of the seabed and its subsoil, and with regard to other activities for the economic exploitation and exploration of the zone, such as the production of energy from the water currents and winds. So that's rather a mouthful, but the key ideas here are that this is a zone that provides jurisdiction over natural resources, living or non-living, so both fish and minerals, as well as other activities of an economic character, including the production of energy from the water currents and wind. So this is a resource and energy zone, essentially, but it's a zone of defined by this economic character. These are economic activities. So essentially, a coastal state has sovereign and exclusive rights regarding the use of living and non-living resources and energy resources within this zone. These are exclusive rights in the sense that if the coastal state does not exercise them, no other state may do so without its permission. 
and these are sovereign rights in that a state may take action to enforce its laws regarding these matters against foreign vessels within the zone. For example, by arresting vessels which are fishing illegally in that 200 nautical mile zone. Because obviously it has jurisdiction to control fisheries as these are questions of living resources. Now, the important point here to note is that these are limited powers. They can only be exercised in respect of these subject matters. The coastal state does not have the same kind of authority it has in its territorial sea out to the 200 nautical mile limit. It can only regulate these issues of resources, energy and economic usage. This leads us on to questions of both jurisdiction and the rights of third states. Let's start with jurisdiction as a separate concept from these sovereign rights. So under Article 60 and 246 of UNCLOS, the coastal state has jurisdiction in the exclusive economic zone over artificial islands, economic installations and structures, and marine scientific research that's conducted on the water column or on the continental shelf within the EZ. In particular, we should note that the coastal state has exclusive authority to authorise the construction of artificial islands, such as oil rigs, and its laws will apply on board to them. So once you've connected an artificial structure to the seabed in the EEZ, the laws that apply are those of the coastal state. All right, let's move on to the position of third states. So those are all the rights and powers that a coastal state might have. What about a third state that wishes its vessels, for example, to have the right to move through the exclusive economic zone, the right of navigation? Well, importantly, other states retain the rights they would have on the high seas of navigation or overflight, and those rights are enjoyed by vessels having the nationality of those third states. So any vessel registered in another state has the right to navigate through an EEZ. They also have the right to lay submarine pipelines and cables. So the telecommunications cables that we're all dependent on in the modern world have to be laid on the seabed and must therefore pass through the exclusive economic zones of various coastal states. Now, an important point to note here is that under Article 58 of UNCLOS, the, the entire regime of the high seas, the whole law of the high seas contained in Articles 88 to 115, which we'll be discussing in a later screencast, the, this body of law continues to apply in the EEZ to the extent that it is not incompatible with the rights and jurisdiction of the coastal state. So for some purposes then, the EEZ is still treated as being part of the high seas. So for example, piracy on the high seas can be committed in an EEZ, and for that purpose the high seas constitutes all waters outside a state's territorial sea. However, there is a balancing act to be performed here. These rights are not absolute. Third states, when their vessels navigate in the EEZ of a coastal state, must have due regard for the rights of the coastal state and comply with its laws and regulations regarding those matters where the coastal state has rights or jurisdiction. So the vessels of foreign states have to have due regard for coastal state interests when navigating through the EEZ and must obviously comply with its laws on such matters as fisheries. All right, what about residual rights? Now, what do I mean by residual rights? Well, the whole idea of the exclusive economic zone is that it involves some sort of balance of rights and interests between a coastal state and other states. This is because the exclusive economic zone arises as we've mentioned in previous screencasts, under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And there was a lot of controversy about giving coastal states rights outside the territorial sea. So a lot of states interested in freedom of navigation or having themselves only small coastlines saw the exclusive economic zone as potentially a subtraction from the freedom of the high seas. So what do we do when the law of the sea is not allocated jurisdiction over a particular activity in the EEZ to either the coastal state or states trying to navigate through those waters. So one example might be the question of 
The exclusive economic zone is meant to be a zone where the coastal state has jurisdiction over the economic uses of the zone. So say the coastal state has licensed foreign fishing in that zone, but those foreign fishing vessels wish to refuel at sea and take on board fuel from a foreign ship. That might be seen as depriving the coastal state of revenue if this at sea refueling or bunkering, as it's called, is occurring within its exclusive economic zone. Now, the issue of bunkering isn't dealt with expressly in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So, what should happen? Well, Article 59 of the Convention appears to provide that disputes in such cases should be resolved on a case-by-case -case basis, and there's a complex formula involved. So, Article 59 says, in cases where this Convention does not attribute rights or jurisdiction to the coastal state, or to other states within the EEZ and a conflict arises about the use of the zone, it should be resolved on the basis of equity and in the light of all the relevant circumstances, taking into account the respective importance of the interests involved to the parties, as well as to the international community as a whole. So this sounds again like a balancing provision. Does that mean that a, an authoritative dispute settlement body could allocate these rights either to the coastal state or the navigating state. So is conducting at sea refueling, in the example I was giving, something that is an economic activity that should be regulated by the coastal state, or is it an incident of the freedom of navigation which is preserved in the exclusive economic zone as a right enjoyed by third states? Well, this issue actually came before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in a case called MV Sega No. 2, which concerned bunkering. The difficulty is the formula in Article 59 is quite vague and difficult to apply, and essentially the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea has been reluctant to find that coastal states have powers going beyond those listed in the Convention, and has certainly been reluctant to come to the view that it can allocate powers not allocated under the Convention. All right, so that concludes our tour of the zones of coastal state jurisdiction in previous screencast we've talked about the territorial sea and internal waters. Uh, we've now discussed the contiguous zone and the exclusive economic zone and in the next in this series we'll be covering issues to do with the high seas. Thank you for your attention and I hope you have found this useful and will tune in for the next instalment.